let's go ahead and start with our grandma's face. Can zoom in a little bit. That's the cool thing about using laptops is you can you can crop and zoom. Zoom in and zoom out. <clears throat> Alright, so after 17 years of painting, um, you just kind of know what colors you're going to use for skin tones. So what works for me, I'm going to, I don't usually do this, but I'll do it this time. Probably because it's, I don't know, it's more of a academic way of doing things. I teach you this in art school. I have a, I don't even know what size this is, I have a palette knife. I, I use two palette knives. So with these guys, I use, I use the bigger one to mix with and I also use it to blend. It also creates texture as well. So you might see me using it on different parts. So the, so the majority of the, the background is going to be just logs, like the inside of a whole gun. It's going to be very dark, you know, and it's going to be very, very pushed back. Like it, it's just, it, it's, it's there to kind of, you know, provide some kind of like props and kind of set the tone a little bit. But really the background is just going to be, whatever's in the background is just going to be used to push um, uh, the figures forward, the people forward that are in the painting. That's all it is. So you want a good push and pull. So it's going to be pretty dark in the background. But I'll use this to kind of, you know, um, for texture and then for mixing as well, you know. But you'll see a, a good um, a variety of, of brushwork back there as well. That's that's for bigger spaces. I'll use it in like skies, like I'll blend, you know, clouds into the blue sky, stuff like that. I'll use it on the ground, like dirt, you know, like it makes great, you know, strokes for dirt. Um, then you put little rocks and sticks in there, you know, little pinks and, you know, whatever colors you're using. Anyway, it's great for that. With the small one, I'll do that on occasion, you know, the same things occasionally. Mostly, I'll use it for detail work. So I'll use it for beadwork. Um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be using it here in the blankets just for texture as well. But then I'll also use it in the face a little bit. So an example would be if I want to do a highlight. So you think about where the highlights are going to be on the face. It's going to be the forehead, the tip of the nose, and the chin, and then maybe a cheekbone. What I'll do is I'll mix my lightest flesh tone color, scoop it up, and then I'll hit the cheekbone with it. It'll, it's just going to be a flat, you know, just a flat stroke. And what that does is it helps bring out the, the accent of the, um, the highlight. And the same thing with, with the girl here. So th but this is mainly used for detail work um, and faces and blankets and things like that. Maybe some jewelry and beadwork. I think we'll use, uh, start out with a number four. Let's see, this is my good brush here. Just bought this brush last night, so it won't let us down. Brand new. Why brand new? Because the, the bristles are all there. It's strong. And it, the, I mean, the fluency in the brush stroke is just a lot more smooth. Um, as opposed to an older brush, you'll get bristles just kind of frayed a little bit. Okay, so for skin tone, Native American skin tone, let's go ahead and mix a basic color. So immediately, I'll bring out titanium white. Um, I'll use ochre. We'll come in with a little bit of cad red and some crimson in here so all warm and then like I said my favorite color cerulean blue is going to be in everything okay this so this is just the basic so I'll use the four colors in white this is just the basic here so what I'll do I'll kind of work my way across this way so we're gonna go kind of a light flesh tone a little bit of that Okay, like right there, I could probably use, but I won't because I have to get exact. Okay, and then we'll, the flesh tones will get actually a little darker. I'll probably get about maybe three or four values here. And what I mean by values is just from my light to darks. And you'll, I'll explain a little bit more as I start painting. So you can kind of see there, All right? And then we won't mix as much white in the next one. tricky part is to keep them separated but you want to use all colors though 
something like that. And this is this is really really warm. Okay. All right. And then the fourth one will be obviously more here here. Still want a little bit of ochre in there. And then we'll start using we'll put in the cool color. So you're almost kind of getting a purple. That's that's a basic skin tone right there. And I'm going to mix more than this, but I just it helps to kind of show everybody what I'm doing and how I come up with my skin tones. So this is a value scale. I could even go actually, I don't know why I didn't do this. I can go lighter. So uh when you're using values, I use seven values in my paintings. And I'll show you here in a minute. What I mean by that, I'm kind of lost that one. Put a little bit of lemon. See, I'll start adding different color, newer colors as I go along, kind of cool it down. A little bit with the blue. Let me try to see if I can get more of this one back. Okay, yeah, something like that. Okay, so we got one, two, three, four, five, five values. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use these to get slow drying medium. Okay, so before before I apply any paint to the canvas, I'll kind of just do a small dip. You don't need much of this stuff because it, it covers a lot. All right, so we're going to try to get an exact kind of a skin tone here. And I figure, you know, she's my mom. We're staying, same color. So here's here's something I wanted to show you guys. So I'll actually pull up my hand here, and I'm thinking, I wonder what's gonna happen if I put it on my hand. So yeah, it's obviously a little bit lighter than I want it to be. Okay, now we can go so I added a little bit of that crimson and cerulean blue. And I come here. So I think I'm right in between. I'm getting close. <laughs> just just keep in mind, the more you add white, the cooler it's going to get. White is considered a cool color. So maybe something like that right there. I'm guessing. And that one just almost disappears in my, in my skin just a little bit. So that, that's actually how I'll try to get skin tone sometimes. So now I know what colors to use and how much. Okay, so what we want to do is I'm going to start. I'm going to start with some mid values. So when you think, so when I'm thinking values, I'm thinking as uh, one being the highlights, the highlights on the forehead, the nose, the chin, the cheekbone. That's the that's as light as I'm going to get. I'm not one is the absolute lightest skin tone. And then two's a little bit darker, not not as light, just a little bit. Three, darker four, five, six, seven. My seventh will be places like underneath the the chin, you know, dark the darkest places in the skin tone. Um, so and that and that'll be my seventh. And what it does is it kind of it just it helps with the three dimensional effect, you know, it makes things look real. So as I start painting, we'll we'll be able to see what I'm talking about. Meaning I'm not sure if it's going to be the exact right color that I want, but it's just, you know, you just got to jump into the cold water. No warm up. Okay, I think I like probably this mixture better. Yep. I never mix my colors all the way. Like, like it's, it's kind of loose mixing. I don't know if that makes sense. So you might see, you know, a little bit of that cerulean blue just kind of hanging in there a little bit, not really mixed into it. One thing that I've learned is you can't make anything look exact. The only reason why is because it shouldn't be exact. People want to see you create something from your own life's experience type of thing, you know. They want to see. They want to see your version of it. 
That's somebody else's. <clears throat> All right, so we're gonna go a darker tone here. There we go. See, I, I just love how that blends together. See, now you can kind of see this like, you know, just like drop off, like it's rolling underneath, you know? That's exactly what you want in the painting. See, we're already getting that established with her cheek and her jaw area. I really should be painting from life, having live models in here. Because, so the camera can only see, I think a little over 200 colors. The human I can see over a thousand. So when I put the head in, um, it just makes everything else come into place a lot easier. So once the head's in there and it's finished, it's like, oh, the body looks a little bit small. I need to kind of make it a little bit bigger, expand more. Or the head's a little bit too small. Let's tone the body down a little bit. But yeah, I, I gauge everything off of it, off the face. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit, this is probably about a six value. I could be wrong. I'm just going to hit all the darker areas first. So like under the nose. And then if you look up right under her, right just beneath her bottom lip, there's a little bit of a shadow. And I'm thinking in planes when I'm painting this. I'm thinking, you know, cheeks, cheekbone, forehead, nose, um, you know, and then the shape of the head. It's, it's Everything's planes. And if you see my brush strokes, it's just, you know, I'm not getting in there. I'm not trying to. You know, blend, 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 blend. It's not painting. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you want to capture form. You want to capture form first and foremost. Okay. So one thing to remember too is the light source is up above. So the higher, so if I'm standing straight up, my face is going to be lit up with by the light. And as, as it goes down, you're going to notice less less light all the way down to my feet so even if i was wearing shiny boots okay the the highlight on my forehead is going to be a lot lighter than the highlight on the on my boots type of thing so it's kind of like light dark like <laughs> and so you got to think in terms of that so it, it's going to be light dark light dark um it just gives a really kind of a nice dramatic feel to it I don't know. I've always was taught that, and I learned um, why that was important. Okay, let's see. So now we're gonna go after kind of the cheekbone area, and work up towards the temples, and then the forehead. Hoping I'm not putting anybody to sleep by now. And this is my work, guys. This is what I do every day. Paint. Even on Sundays. Um, but what I wanted to kind of get to was this Indian market. That same year, it was kind of like my breakthrough year in a way. Um, that same year, I applied for the, they call it the um, Swaya uh, Santa Fe Indian Market Fellowship. And um, it, it was actually a pretty big award. Anybody could apply um, for it. What you do is you send in examples of your work and then you have to write an essay about yourself, kind of just your goals and things like that, what you hope to accomplish, you know, um, with your art. And then uh, you send that in. I sent it in and uh, about a month and a half later, this would have been spring of 2004. <laughs> One of those. Anyway, um, so I got a call from Santa Fe Indian Market. So I offices there saying that I had one. I, I was, so they chose six artists who apply out of probably, I don't know, maybe over 100. And I was chosen that year. 2005 is when it was. 
I was chosen that year as one of the um, recipients, one of the winners. I thought, oh my gosh. But along came with that was a $3,500 monetary award. <laughs> I thought, oh my gosh, bills are paid. <laughs> ah, that was, that was awesome. And then uh, we had the opportunity to go to Santa Fe to a press conference. And I met the other award winners there. And there were jewelers and I think there was another painter. Um, I can't basket weaver. And uh, we got to sit up in one of the fancy hotels there. And the press was there. Albuquerque Journal was there. And they just interviewed the heck out of us. We answered questions for maybe about an hour. Then we did a little luncheon afterwards. Oh, man, it was awesome. Very, very encouraging to get that. But not only that, you got a free booth that year, and you got a really, really good spot on the plaza. And um, did Santa Fe Indian Market that year, and I was happy to tell my gallery that I won this award. And <laughs> um, yeah, it was just a really, really good time, and I, I did well. We, we did sell, we did well selling on on the plaza. We did well that year. And um, I entered a drawing for the composition competition that year. And uh, my drawing got best of drawing that that year, 2005. And I think that one came with like a $600 award. And man, you know, things just started happening. Um, things just started happening like that. And that's part of being an artist, you know, on an artist's journey. You just, you look for opportunities that could up your career and make you better. And you just go for it. Um... But what I really, really, really wanted was I wanted, I noticed, so my gallery, Blue Rain, I noticed that they were putting on art shows and I was looking at people like Tammy Garcia and Tony Abeda and I see, I was seeing what they were doing and I said, oh my gosh, I would love to be included in this show, this annual Native American Indian Market show in Santa Fe. And it was in conjunction with the Indian Market going on at the same time. And I didn't, I didn't say anything. I never said anything to anybody, but I wanted to be part of this show. Um, the following year, the year after I got into Blue Rain, um, I got a call from one of the workers there asking me if I wanted to participate in that year's lineup. They chose about seven to eight artists to participate in that lineup, and there was going to be advertising. Um, I think one year we even, we even showed up in a limo. <laughs> The limo picked us up and we cruised around the plaza a little bit and then we showed up and there was a red carpet and everything and uh, all the artists got out and it, it just was spectacular. I had one of my daughters with me and she was with me in the limo ride and you know we walked into the gallery and everybody was you know clapping and there was music playing and ah yeah I'm 25 years old I'm like whoa what is going on here? Um, so yeah a lot, lot of cool things happening earlier in the career and I think that that's kind of what got me got me going and it's, it's those things like that that are encouraging you know you, you work work your tail off in the in the studio and it's not fun sometimes you work late your know, eyes are bloodshot the next day you're grouchy <laughs> but man you know when, when, it, when it pays off the rewards are definitely worth it Okay, I'm gonna try to get more of this face in here. I'm leaving this spot where the highlight's gonna be, just because I'm not ready to add that highlight color yet. But it's okay because, I mean, if you look at it, you're like, oh, okay, it looks like a highlight. But no, I, I will paint it in. I'm just gonna leave it alone for right now. All right, I'm getting a little messy with my palette work. Let's get this face going. Time's, time's going. Yeah, yeah, I broke my finger bowling the other day. It's this one swelled up pretty bad. Um, so I'm trying to 
Trying to make adjustments here. Yeah, it, it's mostly just for a steady hand. Actually, I have a cane. I forgot to bring my cane. What I'll do is I'll hook it up either right here, just kind of latch it or on my canvas here, and I'll, the cane will come across here. I'll hold it with one hand, and I'll put my hand on it, and I'll just it's just kind of like a steady hand. But um, yeah, I'm missing that. So yeah, just by doing like pinky thing right there, you know, that helps with getting the detail. And it's just for detail. Other other than that, I'm just doing that. But yeah, steady hand is always nice to have. Okay, we'll come down with. As I'm looking at her face here, on the on the screen on the photograph, uh, I'm squinting a lot because I'm wanting to see values. If if you squint at something, anything, anywhere. You're gonna just see the basic shapes, basic colors. And that that's really what I'm painting, is what I'm seeing when I squint. Certain things will pop out more than if you just look at it, you know, with the normal eye. So that's what I'm doing here. Especially when you're painting in landscapes. Sometimes I like to get out from the studio, get some fresh air, and I'll go find a pretty place. Sometimes when I go back to New Mexico, I'll stop in Canyon de Chez or, you know, Long Monument Valley, Cayenta area, and I'll just, I'll just set up my easel and start painting. The beautiful buttes out there. And I do that, I'm squinting at the mountains, I'm squinting at trees, clouds. There's just something about it that you're able to capture that you can if I looked at it indirectly. I had the opportunity to be in San Diego last September, but my uh, primary purpose was to go paint the ocean. <laughs> I wanted to paint um, the beaches out there. So I did that. And where my hotel was, I stayed over off the harbor in San Diego. Um, and there was boats everywhere. And I thought, I've never painted boats. I've always wanted to. So I painted boats. I think the first day I got there, I got two paintings finished. It drove me nuts. It was hot. And there was a lot of people walking by. Lots and lots of people walking by. But it's okay. I don't mind people watching me paint. I've done it quite a bit in my life. So I forgot to mention my college art instructor. His name was Jim Garrison. <laughs> Seen him in a long time. Um, this guy it would be up in your face, up in your grill, watching you paint, basically just waiting for you to make a mistake. And if you made a mistake, he would almost just grab your piece of charcoal from you and say, this is how you do it. <laughs> um, he, he, was, he was pretty intense. But nonetheless, boy, he sure taught me good how to draw. A little bit of an eyebrow there. Okay, at some point I'm gonna put this brush away and I'm gonna have to go smaller to my number two. I finished my first painting out in San Diego in that harbor. I remember packing up and I had all my paints and I was carrying my bag, headed back to the hotel and uh, a guy approached me, said, hey, I, I, did you finish the painting? I said, yeah, uh, yeah I think so. I, I probably spent like an hour and a half, two hours on it, at least the one he saw. And I showed it to him, and he was with his wife, and he says, yeah, we watched you. We didn't want to bother you because, you know, we didn't want to, we didn't want to make you mad or whatever. <laughs> but he, he asked me if, if, I, if I would sell it to him, sell that little painting to him. We ended up um, exchanging inf contact information, and... 
he ended up taking the painting home with him the next day. He's a really cool guy. Had a great time in San Diego. Unintended, but when they're good things like that, then you almost can't beat those type of experiences. I got a goal to get back to Hawaii to do the same thing. I painted out there, uh, I believe in 2008. We were over on Oahu on the North Shore. I painted uh, some beaches out by Kahuku and Laie. I can't remember the, the name of the beaches now. It's been a while back. But one of my funnest memories was I finished the painting of a beach and I noticed there were people swimming right where I was at. And the water just looked so refreshing. It looked so, it was just blue and ah, I was dying. I just wanted to get in. I put my last stroke on the painting. I signed it really quick. And I already had my, my swim gear on, my shorts and stuff. I kicked off my flip flops and my shirt and I ran in and I just jumped into the first wave. What sucks though is you can't take your paints on the plane. They wouldn't let me take my paints on the plane when I traveled to Hawaii. Because they were oil. Same year I met a, a f I think, would you say Fijian? Fiji, Fijian? And he, we just got to talking and uh, he noticed I was, a, I brought the fact that I was a painter and um, he wanted me to paint him. So I took some photographs of him. <laughs> and I never painted him. I never got around to it. I think I still have his photographs. At um, my garage somewhere. But he had a really strong, distinctive Fijian look to him. I wish I had time to to do something like that. Would love to get to know people in the South Pacific like that and maybe paint their culture, people, their land, their islands, if they'd let me. I'd love to be able to do something like that. Actually, my, my goal, one of my big goals in life is to travel and paint people of other nations, countries. Take a little break from my painting my Navajo people. I'd like to get out to Japan, Peru, Spain, Australia. I think Tahiti would be awesome. Tahiti and Fiji would be awesome. Paint some people out there in the, the beaches. I gotta sell all my paintings here so I can afford to go. Okay, it's coming together, the face. So one thing I wanted to point out was the darker areas, I'm gonna be a little bit more neutral. You might see a lot more grays in those areas. And the lighter they get, they're gonna be warmer, more more, you know, fleshy, tony colors, pinks, oranges, you know, things like that. They'll be a little bit more bright. Okay. I think at this point it's time to switch brushes. I'm gonna put a little bit of her ear in there. So just, just a stroke like that, it's like, boom. It's her ear. I know some artists that are brave enough to do that. They just, one stroke, Iron, that's all you need, leave it. <laughs> no. I think that needs a little bit, it's too warm.
See how I'm kind of blending. I'm just one stroke and it's kind of a, it's kind of giving it a nice blending effect like that. Okay, I'm gonna wait on the hair because I want to be able to get um, some of this, some of the skin tone refined in her face, and then I can start putting in the hair. I don't know if you can see my palette here though. You know, you don't, you're not, this isn't intentional. Like I'm not trying to do this, it just happens. But it, it means that, um, you know, that, that your values are are harmonized and they're, they're staying uh, correct when you paint. So you got light to dark. Like, like that's kind of what you want happening on your, on your palette. Like you're subconsciously doing it. Okay. Need to find a little bit underneath her jaw area. I'm gonna blend that a little bit more. There we go. <laughs> One thing I notice that my dad does when he works, I sit there and just watch him work at times. And, uh, He'll make a little tool mark in his stone. And with every stroke, he'll be like, he'll make a stroke. He'll be like, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> it's like these, these things you don't know, know you're really saying, but it just kind of comes out. Okay, I lied. I put in a little bit of of a hairline right there. You can kind of see that. See, the thing, that's why I love about oil painting so much is if it stays dry, you can blend, you know? Because that, so this hairline right here is not sharp. I mean, <laughs> it looks like it's cut, right? It looks like somebody took a clipper and just, you know, made a straight, sharp line. No, it's blended right up in here. Up in here in the hairline, it's all blended into the skin, you know? And then with this, too, um, when, when the painting's finished, you'll actually see the hairbrushes in, in the brushwork and it looks like it'll look like hair. So anyway, something kind of cool. Carve that ear a little bit. There you go. One thing that I noticed that a lot of artists do is there, well, they're just afraid to go really dark. Like even as dark as black. And you can't be afraid to go dark, you just can't. Dark's what really, you know, brings the painting to life. So you go really, really dark and go really, really light. Let's tell people, but I'm scared, Iron. <clears throat> okay, I think I'm gonna switch brushes now. And here's the thing, once I get her face in, everything else just, it comes, it just, oh, I can go to town. It's kind of fun. It's like focus on the face, hands, and feet. Well, if you have those, you're, you're good to go. Everything else can be pretty impressionistic. Okay. We should have went live. So I could ask people what their favorite studio music is.
Yeah, I think it all started with a trip out to Tisnos Boss, where Grandma and Grandpa lived. And it's like, all of a sudden, Hiram, Hiram wants to learn about being Navajo now. <laughs> so, spent a, a good day with Grandma out there. Um, she lives somewhat in the traditional way. She speaks fluent Navajo. And um, I just, I just, you know, immersed myself into everything I could, you know. Her, she, she had stories about the long walk that she would tell me. We'd talk on the phone about certain things. I'd ask her certain questions. And she was just really instrumental instrumental in helping me um, learn all these different things. And and they were just so inspiring. Um, she once told me of a, of a story she heard uh, from one of her, um, I don't know if it was a grandparent or I can't remember. But it was about the long walk and this certain, you know, um, a relative of hers uh, had gone on the long walk. Or I guess I should say relative of ours. He was a survivor of the long walk and he ended up on their way back when they were let go from uh, Bosque Redondo. Some of them went through, some Navajos went through the Zuni area just south of Gallup there in New Mexico. And um, I guess he, he met a Zuni woman there and married her. And he, he never returned to a Canyon de Shea or wherever his home, home was. And I thought that was interesting. I thought, wow, so we, we probably have some Zuni blood in us. <laughs> um, so that, that's always interesting to, to hear and, and think about. But um, yeah, Grandma was there. Um, she, she knew what I was trying to do and, uh, I was, I, she loved to see grandson's paintings. I always try to show her to her when I see him. She's, she's, oh my gosh. Yeah, that's how it was. You know? And then she'd go off on another story. Um, actually I have a, an idea for a painting that she told me once that I want to do. She's so sweet. She, uh. She said there was a time that um, her sister was really, really sick and they were living in Hogan and she wasn't uh, more than 12, 13 years old. And uh, they, uh, the, her parents want, they wanted to stay and, and uh, watch the, the girl. She was really, really, really sick. I couldn't remember fever and everything. And this was, uh, this was well at night probably close to midnight. And she was telling me a story and she said, um, she, her, I believe it was her mother asked her to run over to um, the Atothli uh, medicine man's house. Um, it, it, you know, it, it, at that time it was dark and everything. And, and she said that she, you know, she didn't complain or nothing. She, she said she was, she was scared, but she knew that, um, she was going to be out there seeking help for her, for her sister. And so she got her shoes on and she just ran. She ran all the way. I think it was a couple of miles. She ran out in the dark and she finally found the medicine man knocked on his door and you know, they opened and um, I, th I think they said that they gave her a ride back or something like that. I don't know if it was on horse or a car or what. But they got back and the menace man was able to perform a ceremony and do a blessing on the girl and and uh, I believe she got better. And I thought, oh my gosh, <laughs> there's no way I'd be running out in the middle of nowhere trying to find somebody's house at that age, even as a boy. But I know that a, a story or at least a painting can be told. I could tell a story about that in a painting somehow, some way. So when I hear stories like that, I'm just like, man, that, that is so inspiring. Like, a wow, that's amazing. <clears throat> She's got a lot of stories like that. So what I want to do with my art is I just, I want to be able to capture what we believe in as a people who we intend to be, uh, our ancestors, the ones that have passed on, 
and just share it with the rest of the world. I mean, I got to do a show out in Florida several years back, and, you know, there's, like, the Seminole people out there, I think. But, you know, no Navajo, nothing, no, no Apache. People aren't aware very much of the type of art that's out here. And uh, I took my art out there and, you know, sold a few paintings. But when I got back, I realized, I said, man, there's really, uh, you know, there's a lot of people in this, in, this, in this world, in this country that don't know what's going on over here. And I figured, you know, if I can travel with my artwork and show and exhibit, it's like I'm taking a little bit of the Navajo Reservation to Florida. <clears throat> or I'd like to go out to New York or Chicago. I'd love to be able to show in Paris someday. Take a little bit of the reservation back there and, and share our culture with them. But it really goes two ways, too, because, you know, I mentioned about going to other countries and learning about people there. Just, I'm all about culture. I'm all about seeing what other people do to build up their spirituality, how they worship, how they pray, how they sing, how they dance, the beautiful outfits that they wear. You know, I think it really makes us more open-minded the more we know about somebody else's culture and their beliefs. Rather than just, you know, stereotyping or, I mean, I think, I think we cut down a lot on, on that if we, the more open-minded we are. I'm just that type of a person. I've always been that way. So I am named after uh, Hiram Smith, who was uh, the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith's older brother. Um... I think my parents both went 50-50 on that one. I can't remember. I think they both decided that that's, that's what they wanted to name me. So I guess that's, how, that's where I got my name from, growing up Mormon. I'm part of that. I made a, a Facebook post several weeks back about it. I get asked that all the time. I, I mean, you know, they want to take my name for an order or something when I'm at a fast food restaurant and... And then I have to explain <laughs> almost every single time because it's such a unique name. People want to know, where'd you, where'd you come from? Oh, you're a Mormon? How'd you get into that? How are, you, how, how are you able to be Native American and Mormon at the same time? Or how, <laughs> who was higher? <laughs> so, I, you know, I, it, I, I've had, had or questions come from all types of angles. But... Um, yeah, I mean, it makes for interesting conversations sometimes. I like it. I wouldn't change it. It's good to be unique, I guess. Have you ever met another Hiram? Uh, I, I, I know of other Hirams, but not, not... I don't think I've actually ever met, met one. Met another Hiram. Do you think having that name, if you if you were named something different, would that have affected your journey up to this point in any way? Has that played into any of that? My name? Yeah. Nah, not at all. I wouldn't mind Bob or Doug or Franklin. No, I like my name. Okay, I'm trying to get this nose here. A little bit. Uh... Looking a little big. The drawing was off. <clears throat> okay, moving on down to the lips. It's a little bit of a highlight there. Not too bad. I had a good childhood. A really, really good childhood. Nice home, cars. I could have probably pushed it a little bit more in the classroom at school. 
I was just I was the type of kid that did just enough to stay eligible to play sports. You know, the the guy that does just enough at work not to get fired. <laughs> I was I was that guy. If I had a 2.0, hey, I'm good. Coach wouldn't allow any Fs though. If you had an F, you had to study hall. But yeah, I think um, sports was great. I mean, I played football, ran track, played a little bit of baseball, um, basketball. Football was my was my thing though. I made sure to behave during football season because I didn't want to risk getting suspended or, you know. It was a privilege to play football. Kind of like it's a privilege for kids to have a phone nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. That's where I met all my friends. High school really was just... My culture wasn't Navajo culture in high school. It was... My culture was racing my 5.0 Mustang and girls and football. Yeah, that's really all that mattered back then. But um, yeah, mom was always supportive. Took care of us. Miss mom's cooking to this day. She lives here in the area, so every once in a while we'll get to taste mom's cooking again. Now and then. It's pretty close with my brothers and sisters for the most part, still today. Um, my younger brother, who's just a couple of years younger than me, started doing jewelry. And uh, he's coming along pretty well. Doing pretty good things for himself. They're all in the town for the for the Herd Museum show. Everybody was an artist, though. Everybody I knew. All the dads, you know, my uncles, aunts. Everybody was always an artist. Trying to make a living, trying to pursue it. It's hard. <laughs> I don't think I could... I don't think I'd be able to even support my children if I did something else because I wouldn't... I don't think I could hold on a job somewhere. Or I'd, I'd be too stubborn to want to do it my way and then get fired or something. I'm just, you know, when I'm sick, I work. You know, 10 hours isn't <clears throat> just sitting down in my chair painting like this. It's, I mean... <clears throat> It's it's a it's a business just as much as painting, you know. I mean, I'm I'm emailing collectors, um, people at my gallery, you know, coordinating with them on commissions or you know trying to get work to them, trying to set up shows. You know, of course, I do my own taxes, those type of things. So I'm I'm on my laptop almost, not almost as much, but I mean a lot, like a lot. Um, and then the other part is. Really just getting out, going back to the res, looking for ideas, being with my family. Usually when I head back to Shiprock or Kirtland, I'll see something somewhere and I'm like, yo, that, uh, that, that's a painting right there. Um, you know, so a lot of time spent on the road traveling. The sun's out and it's hitting the side of the rock in a, just a, an amazing way and I gotta have it. Yeah, I'll take my phone out. Something like that. No, it's more just, you know, one thing I like to do is I like to visit trading posts. All right. I'm a trading post guy. I always like to pick something up when I go back, whether it's uh, earrings for one of my daughters or maybe they got a buckskin, piece of buckskin that I, that I want to have. Something like that. I'll pick up some pinions. Just talk to the trader. I know a lot of the traders out there. And, uh, but I'll, I'll see something sometimes, you know, there'll be somebody in there with, with a rug, an older woman, you know, making a sale or trading. And, you know, that's turned into a, a couple of big paintings. Inside of a trading post scene where I had the trader with the cowboy hat moccasins, the jewelry, and he's kind of holding this big rug up. And then on the other end is an Navajo woman holding it big. And he's just looking like, wow, this is amazing. Right, and then the, there's people walking around in the background, and the jewelry, the old antique jewelry cases are just glimmering with turquoise, and you know rugs on the walls, and I'm just like, mm, that's a painting, <laughs> you know, stuff like that. Or I'll be at a family kind of get together, and I'll see my little 
little nephews or nieces running around, chasing each other, playing with a dog outside in the dirt. And I'm just like, yeah, that's a painting, you know, um, and that's just more visual. And I'll just, I, it probably helps write it down. I probably should be writing down those type of things. But, um, I mean, you know, being an artist, you just don't, you never run out of ideas. I never feel like I ever get what a writer would get when he says, I got writer's block where I'm staring at a blank page and I just don't know where to start. I've never gotten that before. I don't, I don't know what that's like. People ask me that sometimes. But, um, you know, again, it's just, I can't explain it. It's just part of being an artist. You just have this kind of divine calling, but it's also, you know, a gift that I'm just, I'm sent ideas. I'm, I'm, I know where to go to get ideas and I'm sent them and it's like they turn into paintings. So, yeah, it's, it's a pretty interesting process. And then from that, it usually turns into a sketch, which turns into setting up models, finding models. The right models, getting close together, doing a photo shoot, and then that comes on to my laptop. And here we go. Sit down and start a painting. So that's, that's kind of a quick rundown of my process. How I do things. Yeah, I was visiting with a, with an artist back in New Mexico a couple of weeks ago. And we kind of were talking about the same thing. And Man, it's just life's experience. Get some experience in something. You know, I, I know I know a guy, an Navajo guy that, you know, he, he knows my work and he's seen some of my paintings and uh, he just say, Hiram, I don't have the talent, but if I wanted to, I could be an artist. And it, this guy's a former Marine, you know, he's a, he, he he's kind of a therapist guy, helping people out with addictions and different, you know, type of problems, mental illnesses, things like that. And he says, because I have life's experience, I, I have 200 ideas. I could be an artist. I should be an artist because I have something to say. And that's just what it is, you know. If they're a painter, they need to paint what they know, right? What they're passionate about, but what they know. Um, this is what I'm passionate about. That's what I know. Um, I have a, another sculptor friend in Prescott, Carl. His name's Carl. <laughs> Good guy. Uh, the guy's a hunter. And, you know, what do you think he sculpts? You know, it's, I mean, he knows the animals. He knows the outdoors and wildlife. And that's what he's passionate about doing. And what makes his sculpture great is because he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's painting. He's there firsthand. And that's, that's all I'm talking about. Paint what you know. Find something. Say it on canvas or sculpture. Speak to people. Speak to people that way. I mean, ideas will come. They'll just come your way. You don't have to look for them. They'll just come. Yeah, I had a... I get dreams too, though, you know? Dreams dreams come a lot. I wanted to share a, a dream that could be an idea for a painting, but if I, I'm afraid if I share it with the world, somebody's going to take that idea from me. <laughs> Sometimes you can't tell. You can't tell everything. It's one of those random, random, random ones that come, and you're just like, "Oh my gosh, I'm writing that down." I got, I literally got up at four. It was like four thirty, and I had to go write it down. Otherwise, I'd forget it. I'd like to get it before Santa Fe Indian Market. Don't steal ideas. <clears throat> it's always best to be original, right? All right, I'll tell you. And I mean, this is more this of an example of you know how I get ideas and stuff. So I'm I'm gonna I don't know if I'm there, or maybe it's more like a movie that I'm watching. But I'm I'm in this, I'm on the. I guess it was in the plains, plains Indian territory, but not too long ago, maybe, maybe like 1940, 
maybe 30s. I don't know, something like that. Maybe it was 50s. I don't know. So there's this setting, and it's a it's this little village of this. I, I can't even tell you what tribe it was, but there's a tribe of natives hanging out in this little neighborhood. There's some houses, small houses, real humble, humble looking houses. And I guess there probably was a kind of a family get together. And I see this old man, old man, gray hair. He has braids, right? He's got braids and he's still dressed in, a, in his traditional outfit. He's probably got a beaded vest on or something like that, looking really nice. But he's old. He's probably nearing 100 years old. The the tone there is that, you know, this is this is grandpa and, you know, we treat him with respect and he, you know, he doesn't have much longer to be with us. So he's there sitting in a chair. He's got a cane. And um so after I would say like maybe after the dinner that they had supposed to dinner everybody's outside just kind of the kids are playing outside and there's a horse corral it's a horse there's horse a couple of horses back there and uh I believe the horses belong to one of the grand one of his grandchildren grandpa wants to go outside so they help him outside they, they, they walk him outside there's probably a granddaughter and a grandson and they sit him down into in some shade maybe underneath the tree or something and he just kind of observing outside, you know, it's, it's nice weather. Everybody's just kind of talking amongst themselves and hanging. And then he, he motions to one of the, the grandsons and he, in his native language, whatever Indian language he was speaking. I almost just want to say it's Sioux or even uh, Cheyenne. He motions to one of the grandsons, and the grandson just kind of, you know, he goes up, he goes really close, really close to the grandfather, listens to what he says, and, and then he, the grandson kind of backs up, and, and he says, he does this, kind of motions like, no, 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 we're not, we, we can't do that. And the grandfather's just insisting on whatever he's talking about. And then the brother, or the grandson kind of motions over to a, um, one of the, I guess, a sister, so a female or somebody, there, and uh, and they're they're saying no too, so she goes over to grandpa and she says, no, 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 we're not going to do that. So after about maybe fifteen minutes of this, one of the sons finally, it looks like he kind of gives in to what grandpa's saying, and he goes over to the horse corral, and he. He uh, he lets one of the horses out, you know, puts a bridle on him and kind of leads him out of the, the corral. And uh, they start getting Grandpa up. Grandpa wants to get on the horse. <laughs> All right. So he gets on with the grandson behind him, holding him. So he doesn't fall on. They, they manage to get him on the horse. And he says in his language that, you know, he's going to go pretty soon and he just, he wanted to ride the horse one more time. He kind of took him back to his, his brave days, you know, his, his war days. He fought. He fought in some battles back then. I'm painting less as I'm telling this story because I'm trying to, I'm trying to recollect everything. Forgive me for that. But, um, so he gets on the horse and they go a few rounds around the corral you know, the daughters are really kind of just, they're kind of following behind, like, don't fall, hold him. They're telling the, the grandson this, and he's like, no, don't worry, everything's okay. And uh, at some point, um, the grandfather, he raises up his hand like this, and he starts a war cry. Like, oh, 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 he starts, but it's so cute. It's so soft. It doesn't even sound like a, a, a grown man. It sounds like a little kid yelling. And he's just going around and circling, circling, circling. And, and uh, 
and that pretty much is it. <laughs> they let him off the horse, and and he's happy, and he's, um, he, he you know he's he's glad that he was able to get back on the horse one more time. Later that evening, um, he he passed on. Like that's all he wanted to do. I, I I don't know how that story or that dream came. I just I see this old man yelling on a horse with his grandson in back, and I'm just like, holy cow! What does this mean? What is this about? So I'm trying to find a, a model for for the old man um, and the right horse, I guess. I I don't know how I'm gonna put it together or what I'm even gonna call it, but. I mean, it's just stuff like that I get. Like, where does that come from? Like, are, do you have these type of dreams too? <laughs> you know, to the to the next person. Put a little bit of more hair in there. To start to finish the face. Last ride for Grandpa. Get the other eyeball in there. Okay, kind of looks like mom a little bit. Not too bad at this point. Okay, it's time for that highlight now. Get one on the cheekbone too. There we go. On the nose a little bit. Okay, and I'll come back and hit that with that palette knife. Once I get a little bit more refined. Get some quick highlights on the hair. So for highlights in the in darker hair at least, I'd use cerulean blue, cad red, and lemon yellow. You kind of get like this grayish purple look to it. I mean, obviously it's gonna vary by your lighting, but you kind of just Go, go like go with go with the grain of the hair kind of like that right. okay and finish this up in just a couple minutes 
All right. A little bit of bun in there. A little bit of her bun here. See how it comes around right there. There we go. Okay, so she's wearing a darker green shirt, but I'm gonna lighten it up because it looks too, you can't really see, it just looks like a, like a gray, kinda looks like a gray shirt. So maybe, Wherever there's green, I always put in lemon yellow and red. All right, this is where it's gonna get fun. Just do big strokes. Over there, come down here. So for this one, you'd want two values of gray or green. One for your darks and one for your lights. You think in terms of getting your darks and then your lights to get your form. And then if you can do that, things will go a lot smoother. So a dark would be right there. That brush stroke. Just kind of come up there. I feel like a little kid making all these sounds. See, going back to that accent thing, this is what I was doing with the initial drawing. It's, I don't know if you can see, but right underneath the arm there, that's going to be my dark it's dark. So you want to do that. So I'm, I'm just placing the green there just, just to kind of get the feel of where that dark is going to be. But in actuality, what I want to really be doing is I want to get, I want to, I want to do this. I want to come up like this. And what that does is it provides it, it, it's, it establishes form, you know, it makes it, it's more painterly rather than just putting a stroke and, and that's it. No, it's like, it's, it's like you're kind of getting, it just makes brush stroke look a lot more interesting rather than just a boring old, like you never want to just do that. Like, like, you know, switch it up a little bit, kind of do the, it's like cross hatching type of thing. Yeah. That's what you want to do. Okay. One last stroke here and we'll be, I think that face will be blocked in pretty good. See, here's a good example. You just don't want to come straight down. Oh, it's there. No, make it interesting. Come in here, do that. Then you can even go lighter. Get some highlights in there a little bit. Boom, boom. Right there's a couple of them. Right there. And then definitely right here. Come in there. And all that right there. So that's gonna be nice and dark. I'll make some highlights on that. And then that blanket will really pop because there's a lot of lighter colors in that. Not too bad so far.